Turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 5. I am in a third part and the final part of this on prayer, preparing us for our Holy Week that is coming up next Monday, starting next Monday night at 6.30. I'm excited about that as well. So had an interesting time this morning. I went to bed regular time to get up. You remember what time I get up? So I was, went to bed at 8 o'clock. I'm going to be ready, ready to go, get up at 4 o'clock, and I was woke up at 3 o'clock. And I went, really? So I went down, got my cup of coffee, and I sat down. I said, so what am I doing at 3 o'clock in the morning? And that's just what I heard the Lord say. The Lord said, I'm going to give you seven pages of notes that you're, that you're going to prepare. Get your laptop and type as fast as you can. And then halfway through it, I said, I'm, I'm not Pastor Jacob. I can't do seven pages. Uh, and I'm still typing, and I'm still hearing, and I'm writing and getting ready. Scriptures are just flowing. And so I get all those things ready. So I got it all ready, started praying over that. And I said, wow, I don't think I've ever preached a seven-page message. On a Wednesday night, I'm going to be able to preach for about three hours tonight. Hallelujah. <laughs> And when I, well, I was kidding when I said that, but when I said that, I believe I heard the Lord say in my heart, now I want you to rest on that. And when you get to the office, I don't want you to cut and paste and dice and remove, but I want you to begin to hone down the word that I'm going to say to you, because this is part of this is a prophetic word about preparing our hearts to get ready for next week. So I did. So when I got to the office, I, I rested and I, and I prepared, and my, my seven pages of notes and scriptures went to two. And I said, wow, I don't think I've ever been edited quite that much. <laughs> Lost five pages of notes and scriptures. So, so I told the Lord, I said, so, so seven, seven to two, wow, so two pages. So what would be the title? Now, this is good if you're ever going to be preparing sermons or messages or teachings or Bible studies. Here's a good place to start. You save your title for last. So I did. I said, so what would you like for me to call this message tonight that I'll be bringing? And the name of the message tonight is called Undivided. Undivided. And through the two pages, I'm going to give you 11 verses of Scripture. We're going to talk about what does it mean in preparing our heart, that we do not have an undivided heart, but we have a, a heart that is prepared and that is, is correct and is postured and poised. I believe with all my heart that many times the Lord is saying things to people and they're not hearing it. Did you hear me? Yes. It goes right on by him. And there's many ways that he can do that. He can do that through other people. He can do that through prophetic words. He can do that also through when the Holy Spirit speaks to us. It can be through promptings, impressions, thoughts, ideas, those things. Even the word of knowledge that, that I had for that, whoever that person is, maybe for a few of those, but specifically I heard it for, a, for a, one person. And I actually felt the pain in that spot that I pointed to, and I felt my eye twitch is a reason that I knew. So my word of knowledge was not just a thought or an idea or a phrase. It was actually felt that part. And so as I begin to say that to this, declaring it in the body, that thing that was happening to me stayed with me till I said it, and when I said it, it left. Which it's an affirmation that the Lord is going to heal whatever that is that's happening in that person's uh, location I gave you. So... What does it mean to have undivided hearts? Jesus said that no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to one and despise the other. That's Matthew 6, 24. So it's possible for us to be in a place where our heart gets divided. So I looked up a a couple of definitions, and so this is what I found. What is a divided heart? Simple definition is that a divided heart describes the person who is in love with two people. When Pastor Jacob touched on Sunday morning about there being idolatry and wickedness, idolatry in our world today is when we have anything that comes between us and God is considered idolatry. Definition of of that divided heart is when you're trying to love two people. Has anybody ever struggled besides me of trying to love yourself and God at the same time? Thank you for being honest. And so... That's difficult when we're trying to love and we're trying to love the Lord and walk in those things. And, 
And sometimes we fight self-centeredness. We fight this thing about what we think and what we want and all those things. And so I, that's why I love that the way we deal with those things in our heart is that we have to humble ourselves. Well, I got a thunderous applause on that one. Hallelujah. <laughs> we humble ourselves. How many, how many have humbled yourself lately beside me? Now, if you didn't raise your hand, we're talking about maybe you need to be humbled. <laughs> that we're going through these. And so in the word it talks about in James, James said that we're to humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord that he can lift us up. So part of the thing that God gave us to do is to humble ourselves. Listen, if we humble ourselves, then God promotes us. But if we promote ourselves, then God humbles us. I'll say one more time. If we're trying to just promote ourselves all the time, then we actually take away God's job. And if we take away God's job, then God's without a job. So God takes our job <laughs> and he humbles us. So we all need to keep our heart right. And part of that way that that happens is by keeping ourselves in this place of humility. Undivided is defined in the dictionary as not divided uh, just into parts or groups, but concentrated on one idea or object is what undivided is. Synonyms for undivided hearts are whole, entire, exclusive, concentrated, deliberate, undistracted, wholehearted, where I'll be tonight, single, steady, unbroken, full, intent, unswerving. So, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5, in the Old Testament, we're told to love the Lord our God with some of our heart. Is that what it says? We're to love the Lord with how much of our heart? With all of our heart, with our whole heart, we're to love the Lord with all of it. And so when it gets divided away or tries to get taken away or goes to someplace else, then it becomes a problem for us in our walk with the Lord. So he said to love him with all of our heart. So it reads like this, you shall love, by the way, you shall is not an option. It's not a hint of an idea. It actually is a commandment. Did you hear me say that? So he's telling us, you really don't have an option in this. I'm telling you what you need to do. In order to keep your heart right, he said that you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. In the New Testament, Jesus quoted it as the number one commandment is this. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, all your mind. And the second like unto it is you shall love your neighbor as you love yourself. Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven. 37. So... In all of my introduction about that, knowing that we're going into Holy Week, what's the number one thing we have to stay focused on is keeping our heart right, making sure our heart doesn't get captured by other things, taken away by other things, making sure that our heart stays together, not divided. An inter interesting fact, did you know that your natural heart is divided into four chambers? Y'all are not, and y'all knew that. Very good. I didn't know that. And did you know that in your heart that you have a muscle that goes down the center of your heart that keeps those parts of those heart working right? Boy, y'all are nodding your head, y'all. Y'all already studied this out. <laughs> there's a heart, there's a muscle that does these things. So the function of the heart is part of it is taking and dealing with oxygen in the blood and part of it's dealing with the other parts and pumping it out in our body. I believe the same way that the number one thing that the enemy sets as a target on you and I is to take... It's not just about us being in church. He don't mind us being in church. But if our heart's not there. He don't mind us being in the Bible and reading the Bible. But if our heart's not there. He doesn't mind us being around brothers and sisters. Having fellowship one with another as long as our heart's not there. So it's important that we work on that part of our hearts and make sure that we're pumping and we're breathing and we're loving and all those things like we are supposed to. In Matthew chapter 6 in the Lord's model of prayer... Um, he is talking about the heavenly father. And then the disciples ask him as they saw him, I believe, praying. They saw him and they asked him to teach them how to pray. And so in that prayer that, that the Lord models for them, I believe that what was going on was that he was a, it was a custom of his to pray like this. He went to a place of prayer by himself and he prayed to the Father. And the disciples recognized that when he came down from that time or, or from the garden of that time or from a mountain of that time, they recognized that when he started walking in his ministry, that he was walking in the power of that prayer for the rest of the day. So they looked at them and, and looked at Jesus and said, hey, teach us to pray like that. 
Doesn't that sound like a good thing to do? Especially if you're going to go pray for somebody and you want to see them healed, wouldn't it be a good thing to, hey, teach us to pray like that? So what the Lord started with, I think it's pretty cool, was about His relationship with the Father. So He teaches with our Father. I think it's interesting because He'd been saying, my Father, my Father, my Father. Now it's time to teach. And when He starts teaching, then it turns into just not my Father. He listened. So they were listening to Him and watching Him. So He goes, uh, so you pray like this. Our Father, making it a reference to our Father, which is in heaven. Then he uses this kind of weird name, weird term, and he says, Hallowed be thy name. How many know what Hallowed means? Holy? Hallowed me. It got too close to being Halloween for me. It threw me off. <laughs> Hallow, hallowed. It's weird. So what does hallowed mean? It means that we want to make sure that we're going to reference the name of the Lord, reference the name of our Father that is always something special because He is holy. So we're keeping that right with us. That's what He's talking about in the hallowing of His name. Psalm 86, verse 11. You want to turn there? Psalm 86, verse 11. In Psalm 86, 11, it says... To teach me your way, Lord, that I may rely on your faithfulness. Give me an undivided heart. And then he says, that I may fear or that I may respect or reverence your name. One of the things that is missing in the generation that we're living in, and maybe the generation before our generation that we're living in, is people, a lot of people have lost their fear or respect of God. They've lost a respect of, of holiness. They've lost a respect of what it means to, to be gathered together in a church. They've lost a respect. The fear went right out the window. So one of the things I heard in my prayer time this morning was we need to make sure that we're understanding it's not a fear like a phobia or a fear like being afraid or scared. But what he said was, teach me your way, O Lord, that I might rely on your faithfulness. Give me an undivided heart, listen, that I may fear your name. So is our heart right? So one of those checks for us is, are we reverencing, respecting, honoring, loving the Lord? And if we're not like we need to be, then that's one of the checks we need to check on getting our heart uh, to that undivided place. Ezekiel chapter 11, verse 19 says, I will give them an undivided heart and I will put a new spirit in them. I will remove from them their heart of stone and will give them a heart of flesh. That happens whenever we become born again. When the Lord comes to live inside of our heart, when we became saved, that's what exactly is what happened. We got a brand new heart. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 said that we became a brand new creation. Old things passed away and all things became new. So he began to work on some things. And so we, you didn't know it, but you had a spiritual heart transplant on the day that you became born again. The stone was taken away from you and it gave you a heart of flesh, something that can, that can move, something that you can feel. It should be when we're talking about the presence of the Lord in the house that we are all able to sense and recognize the presence of the Lord is in the house, yes. right? So having a heart for that is recognizing that, man, the Lord is here. There's actually a verse in the Bible, I don't have this one written down, but there's a verse in the Bible that says that the presence of the Lord was there and they did not know it. Well, thank you, Jesus. That's not victory life. Amen. That when the Lord is here, we sense His presence. We know He's here. We know that His presence is here. And so that's, that's important. In 1 Chronicles chapter 28 and verse number 9, 1 Chronicles 28 9 says, and, he, and to Solomon he said, My son, I charge you to acknowledge your father's God and to serve Him with an undivided heart and a willing mind. He knows all our thoughts and desires. Listen to this next part. If you go to Him, He will accept you. I heard that as a prophetic word as I was finalizing and getting ready for tonight. That if you go to Him, remember last week was part of the prayer is that we need to be people that ask God. God wants us to ask Him. He wants us to talk to Him. He wants to be able to answer. Somebody I heard about before service said that they were believing God for a car and, and asked God for a car. They wanted to be blessed of the Lord. And God, I need a car. And you know what happened? They got a car. Amen. Hallelujah. It ought to be like that. That we ask. If you ask not, you. But if you ask, you receive. Right? 
So that's part of this blessing. Hallelujah. All right. If you go to him, he will accept you. I heard it prophetically that there's also somebody that maybe a few somebodies that's going to be in the room tonight. And so you're wondering if God even hears you anymore. And the answer is that he does. If you go to him, he will accept you. And what the enemy would love to do is just keep you driven away, making you lonely, making you sad, trying to deflate your hope. And yet if you go to him, he will accept you. And so that's part of a fear that the enemy tries to use on us as well, is that God doesn't care. He's not listening. He's not paying attention. I used to say he's looking at China when he ought to be looking at America. <laughs> but that's not true. According to the Bible, God is every place. I can't wrap my brain around this, but God is every place at the same time. Theologically, it's called that he is omnipresent. He is all present. I don't know how, but he's every place at the same time. I don't know how, but he is. Oh, and a cool fact also, this morning in prayer, the Lord said, by the way, I'm the only one, human beings can't, but I'm the only one that can step out of time, and I can look at time from the beginning to the end. I said, I, I read that, I, I know that, and, and I heard the Lord say back, I believe in my heart, this word. He said, but do you know why I can say that Jesus is the author and the finisher of your faith? Is because he also sees this, and that's why he encourages you, because he not only sees your beginning, he also sees your ending. Listen, and he is the author of your faith. Not you. He's the author of it. He's the one that gets to describe. So when you talk about things that you feel down and depressed and all those things that going on and gloom, despair, and agony on me, <laughs> deep, dark depression, excessive misery, hee-haw moment, yeah. <laughs> if it weren't for bad luck, I'd have no luck at all. Gloom, despair, and agony on me. <laughs> well, that's a sad tune, isn't it? I mean, you watch much of that stuff, you're going to get gloom, despair, and agony. <laughs> that's a mess. So I believe the Lord wants us to hear that word about accepting. If you go to Him from the Bible, He will accept you. 2 Kings chapter 20, verse 3. 2 Kings 20 and 3 says, Remember me, Lord. He said, how I have walked in your presence with integrity, with an undivided heart, and I have accomplished what is good in your sight. In 2 Chronicles chapter 9, verse 19, verse 9, these were his instructions to them. You must always act in the fear of the Lord with faithfulness and an undivided heart. Hallelujah. Psalm 138.1. So what does it mean to have this undivided heart? I believe it's the same parallel with another couple of words, and that is the word a whole heart, that we need to have a whole heart. So we don't need to have divided heart. We need to have a whole heart. So I want um, in this next section to talk about three verses of Scripture and what does it mean to have a whole heart. In Psalm 138, verse 1, Psalm 138, verse 1 says, I will praise you, listen, I will praise you with my whole heart. That's one thing I love about praise and worship in our, in our campus. I love praise and worship. To hear that when we're singing, and we're singing with our whole heart. And you don't have to be loud to do that. Did you know that? But you do know you need to sing if you're going to sing. Hallelujah. You don't sing in your head. <laughs> it's going to come out your mouth. Right? Okay, I'll go to this side. <laughs> so when we're going to sing, we need to sing with our whole heart. Doesn't mean we have to be loud, don't have to scream, but we do need to sing. And if you're going to sing, don't sing like this and just, bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. <laughs> but you're to sing. You need to have, at least you hear and you sing. <laughs> Don't even mean that everybody on the front row hears you sing, but you need to sing. So he says, I will praise the Lord with my... Now think with me, why would that be a verse in the Bible? And the reason because people don't. Because of, of fears or problems or all these things. And I don't want to sing hee-haw again. They have these problems. And when they have these things, then they're, they're tempted, listen, to be shut down and to be silenced and to not praise the Lord. But I'm telling you, the way that we voice and the way that we show that we have a whole heart that's going to the Lord is that I will praise Him with my whole heart. Psalm 119, verse 2. Psalm 119, verse 2. 
Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with a whole heart. Did you hear what I said? Very first word is an important word. It says that we are blessed if we keep his testimonies and if we seek him with our whole heart. There's a blessing attached to that, that we're seeking him. And as we're seeking him, then he says he blesses us. Well, I'm afraid that if I seek the Lord, then I'm not going to get anything from the Lord. No, no. If you seek him, then he's going to bless you. Everybody say this out loud. You ready? Say, I am blessed. blessed. We are. We're blessed because that verse says that we are. And part of that that's attached to it is we're seeking the Lord with our whole heart. Last verse, I think. Maybe one after this. Mark chapter 12, verse 33. And to love him, Jesus said, and to love him, to love the Lord with all the heart, with all the understanding, with all the soul, and with all the strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Those are the two great commandments. So what then is a whole heart? A heart that is fully committed to God and to his will. An undivided a heart is a heart that is set on God and is willing to submit to him in complete surrender. Wow, I said a lot. So I'll let it stay up there a minute so you can write it down. How do we know we have a whole heart? It has those kind of words that's in that. I'll say one more time. A heart that is fully committed to God and to his will. An undivided heart is a heart that is set on God and is willing to submit to him in complete surrender. May we always and completely love the Lord with an undivided whole heart. Amen? Amen. I got one more verse of scripture that's for us. And it was a prayer of David. David prayed this prayer. And so as we're going into Holy Week, I thought it was pretty good to, to end on this one for you. In Psalm 86, if you're taking notes, Psalm 86 and verse number 11. Psalm 86, 11 says this. From the message translation, train me, God, to walk straight. Then I'll follow your true path. Put me together, one heart and mind then undivided, I'll worship in joyful fear. From the bottom of my, of my heart, I thank you, dear Lord. I've never kept secret what you're up to. You've always been great toward me. What love. That's a prayer, David. So may it be the same with us in this holy week that we're coming upon, that we sense the presence of the Lord, and out of that heart committed to him, that we, we sense and know the presence of the Lord in a greater way tonight and next week. Amen. Anybody get anything out of the Word tonight? Hallelujah. Thank you.